Welcome back to Question Time. You know, it's been a strange year this year. The news is popping up about investments that we have never expected to be in trouble. And I think that's where Steve Brin is going to take us today. Steve? Yeah, sure. Well, um, topic today is Intel being a bit of a disaster. And I don't know if it kind of fits the category of never expect to be a problem because this company has been a problem for a while. Uh, stock's down about 60%, which isn't quite a haircut, a little bit more like a decapitation. Joe, <laughs> your thoughts on Intel? <laughs> Well, my thoughts are I'm literally glad we don't own it. <laughs> That's my first thought. Ah, Intel. You know, there's a whole bunch of things going on there. Uh, you know, first of all, Intel is an incredible company. And Gordon Moore, who is uh, the guy there, gosh, I think I think actually he ultimately came out of Fairchild Semiconductor back in the 60s. I mean, they was there a long time. And he was the guy who really put the company on the map uh, by formulating what was called Moore's Law which is uh, basically that you're going to get twice the, uh, the twice the speed, I guess it is, or power, whatever you want to call it, out of a chip uh, on, the, uh, on a yearly basis. And, and it, it, you keep bringing the scale down, bring the scale down, bringing the scale down, so you get more and more power from, a, from a, uh, the size of the chip. Anyway, they've lived off of that for 40 years now because they keep coming up with new chips. And I would still say, too, something I think maybe people are, are – I won't say poo-pooing, but they're not paying attention to it. Intel is still the dominant CPU processor manufacturer in the world in the x86 architecture. Remember, you guys might remember this. Remember when we used to get uh, Microsoft new you know, so software? It would be uh, uh, the 286, the 3, or actually, I guess it was Intel chips and the computers. You got the 286, the 386, the 486, and then the Pentium, and blah, blah. that's the x86 architecture. That's what that is. And they're the dominant producer there. I mean, it's not even close. But uh, they have been losing a, a market share to AMD, which they didn't for a long time because AMD was not able to get an x86 license. But they finally did, and they've been competing and, and taking some market share. But even so, Intel is still by far the dominant player. That's PCs and servers. That's where that, that's where that lives. Um, but that's not the growth part of the business, obviously. And I would also say that even in CPUs, if you look at a lot of the things that use computing power today, tell or you know iPhones, things like that, I, and Apple, the Apple architecture itself uh, for the Mac and so forth, is no longer that x86 architecture. They use the RISC, uh, reduced instruction set computing (RISC), uh, and that runs on a different platform, not the x86. It runs on the ARM platform. Uh, and that's almost all, all your cell phones and, and mobile devices, iPads, things like that, and all the Apple eco, eco structure runs on that different architecture. Now, the thing that has saved Intel is that Microsoft continues to run on x86, but we know that Microsoft has tested ARM, uh, ARM type uh, software as well. So if they lose that, they're really sunk. Uh, but so far, they've been able to maintain the largest market share in that, in that, in that space. But uh, that's not where the growth is. The growth is in AI and other types of chips, um, just tons of different things that are not CPUs. And they're not very big in those businesses. They have some things in automotive, uh, automotive for instance, they just spun off a company called Mobileye, which was their automotive division. But you know, even there, they're not, they're not even close to dominant like they are in CPUs. Anyway, look, the company's kind of got some issues here. Last year, I think they ran uh, negative free cash flow of about 12 and a half billion. They're trying to spend to catch up with uh, with on the AI side. We'll see. And this is where it comes in too from the Chips Act. Uh, something I mentioned yesterday, and I, 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 you know, I'm not a big fan of government directed investment because, uh, as we said yesterday, just like in in in, uh, in Indiana Jones movies, uh, he, they choose poorly. They often do that. And so in this case, I think, you know, if you look at the money that's been dispersed out of the CHIPS Act, uh, Intel's like 25% of the total. Uh, they've bet big on Intel uh, to the tune of close to $20 billion. Round the numbers off, they get about $9 billion direct and about $11 billion in, in loans. Uh, $20 billion going to Intel. Why they chose Intel, I don't know. They got the best lobbyist, I guess. Uh, but even with that, they ran negative free cash flow of twelve and a half billion last year. Their debts are roughly well, liabilities. Take everything is ninety billion, and they got about thirty billion in cash. Uh, 
and they've cut their dividend. I don't know if it's nothing, but it's cut it way down. I think they're going to pay out maybe a couple of billion dollars in dividends this year. I, I, they're in trouble. And uh, it just goes to show, too, that we ought not let the government, like I said, pick and choose winners and losers because they're inevitably going to be on the losing side. Uh, look, Taiwan Semi, AMD, Qualcomm, uh, you know, there's just a ton of companies out there that are that are kicking Intel's butt. Uh, I am not ready to buy the stock in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this is the type of thing that we do, by the way. One of the things that, that I've done over the years and has worked out very well for me is to find companies with great brand names that are having problems that I think they can solve. And the key to that is <laughs> that they can solve because <laughs> I'm not sure that Intel can solve these problems. Uh, they've got a real financial difficulty here. It's not just that, you know, their technology is not keeping up or whatever. They've got a, a financial hit here and they may, they may just run out of time. I, I don't know, but I'll put it this way. I, you got to see some evidence that things are turning around before you, uh, before you, you get involved. And so far there is no evidence of that. Last quarter was terrible. Uh, missed earnings estimates badly. It's just, just a, a disaster. And so, uh, you know, I, we, I think reason Steve brought this up, I, I think, <laughs> is because of the aspect about the investment and what's going to happen to it. And this is what we were talking about. When we talk about economic growth in the United States, we, we, well, in any country, it's about workforce growth and it's about productivity growth. And this big investment by the government in Intel is supposed to be at the, about the productivity part of that equation. I don't think you're going to get it. And if you don't get it, it means that we've spent $20 billion of, of taxpayer money on something that's going to be a giant white elephant that doesn't ever produce the results that we wanted it to produce. And what that means is you wasted $20 billion in capital and $20 billion in capital is not insignificant. Uh, so you got the activity you in the short term, but you don't get the growth in the long term. That worries me tremendously because that on the, in the end is going to be inflationary because capital is somewhat scarce. Capital is not money, by the way. You know, people think, oh, well, let's print up some more dollars. Yeah, you can do that. And it's going to be inflationary. So uh, that's what worries me about companies like Intel that are kind of sucking at the government teat. And uh, once you get on that thing, it's kind of hard to get off. And I suspect we're going to be subsidizing Intel for a very long time uh, because, well, actually, you know what? It probably depends on politics. If Donald Trump were to win the election, I bet you that Intel will be failing quicker because that will be something that the previous administration did, which he'll get rid of. And if the, the, the other side wins, the Harris side wins, they'll be subsidizing it to kingdom come because they don't want to admit defeat. Uh, they're no different than the average investor who holds onto their losers and sells their winners. Um, so yeah, it's not a great situation, not a great situation. Uh, you know, I, I guess there's, I, I guess there's this kind of, you know, national security issue is what we're really talking about here. That's why we wanted to build semiconductors in this country. Apparently, we don't want to be beholden to Taiwan Semi, uh, and China takes over Taiwan, uh, which is probably why Taiwan Semi is getting some money to build a plant in the United States too. Which, by the way, they're having trouble do trouble doing. Uh, and I guess my last piece of this puzzle is, I, I keep asking this question, and nobody yet has come up with an answer. So if we spend all this money on on semiconductor plants, whether it's Taiwan Semi or Intel or anybody else, who the hell is going to man them? We don't have the workers. And it's not just a matter of bodies. you got to have technically competent workers, which is not insignificant. And I don't think we have them right now. So even if we build all this stuff, I don't see how it, it gets manned properly without significant changes in the immigration policy, put it that way. So anyway, yeah, Steve, Intel's a mess. Uh, we're not going to touch it with a 10 foot pole right now, <laughs> but we will, uh, we will, we will keep, be keeping an eye on it. That's for sure. So the gospel, according to Joe on Intel, if you've got financial or market questions, put them in the comment section down below.